Okay, well, the first question, I, you know, I, I rewatched the first movie on, on Monday night just, just to, you know, refresh and recharge. And when I saw the movie on Tuesday, like, not a second goes by between the two films. Right. What, was, what was behind the decision to, to pick it up right away instead of, like, having, like, an older bio, an older dash, an older Jack Jack? I just thought it was kind of bold and weird. Um, because uh, I think people uh, take the time that passes very literally, and they think that linearly uh, the, the character should have aged. But if they age, uh, their superpowers don't reflect the part of life that they're in and their role in the family. So, um, you know, I worked on the first eight seasons of The Simpsons, and, and The Simpsons are, you have an age today, and they're still on the air. So it worked for them. And why not? Not why not? I, why not? I, yeah. You know, don't worry about makeup or anything like that. Right. But but Nicole and John, there has obviously been a big leap in technology since the first movie. You know, how did you really take advantage of those of, of those advancements and improvements to make Incredibles to really pop on the screen? Uh, well, honestly, the technology has allowed us to make the film look more like what Brad intended it to look like the first time. Uh, the characters are much more finely nuanced and developed. Uh, we were able to, to build a lot more sets more quickly. We've populated the world with a lot more characters that have hair and clothing. And that's stuff that you know most of y'all don't notice, but actually that makes the world feel richer and, and more alive. Uh, not to mention all the other visual effects stuff. And we've also got a lot of, new, of artists who have had 14 years to get better at their craft, and a lot of artists who were some of them kids when the first film came out, and it's a dream come true for them to work on this film. Well, well one, one member here who wasn't even a kid when the first movie came out. <laughs> oh, man. So, so, Huck, when did you see the movie, the first movie, for the first time? And how did it come about that you're going to be part of Incredibles 2? Well, I saw the first movie when I was like five or something. Because um, my... He was becoming a man. <laughs> my dad showed me it because he really loved the first one. And I really loved it too. And my favorite character was Dash. <laughs> so, um, and That's unexpected. And when um, when I got the uh, audition, um, I I just I was watching the movie over and over again. And when my mom got sick of watching it, I used the audition as a excuse to watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like being at the premiere the other day with everyone that you had made the movie with, and especially because you were such a big fan of the first one? It was amazing and overwhelming because, um, like in the beginning when I got out of the card, I was like, sign this, sign this, and I'm not used to that. <laughs> then when I got inside, I, I, um, I felt more welcome than I felt, and it was just really amazing to be there. Well, congratulations. Thank you. So a lot of people, I'm sure, have noticed, and certainly uh, it's getting picked up a lot, is the role reversal with this movie between, uh, you know, Elastigirl and Mr. Incredible, and Violet really steps up, and, and there's there's other things that happen in the film, too, and we want to be careful of spoilers, but, but Holly, you know, what was your first take when you first read the screenplay, however long ago that was, and saw that role reversal? Well, I didn't read the screenplay, because there wasn't really one. <laughs> He's the screenplay. He was my walking encyclopedia. He, he has ages. <laughs> um, yeah, he was my instruction manual. That's that's it right there. So, Brad. I mean, we were like, yeah. It was it was a while before I truly, really, before I truly realized what I was really going to get to do in the movie. And I was, you know, really thrilled. Um, but it, it was like a retroactive thrill. Because over a period of months before I started gleefully singing during our recording sessions about how great my part was. <laughs> um, but to me, it was just really fun. I mean, I, I don't think that this is a message movie at, 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 in any way. Um, I think it's purely like luck, luck of the draw that this happens to be dovetailing 
with Me Too and Time's Up. But obviously, Time's Up, okay? It's, <laughs> and, and I feel that way personally, and it happens to be, be serendipitously reflected in this particular movie. But at the same time, you know, it's, 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 revela it's character revelation, period. Everybody is having revelations, including Jack Jack. I mean, all the characters are revelations to the audience and to themselves. Um, and so, I'm no exception as Elastigirl. Even, the, it, even there's a raccoon that goes on in the hero's journey. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I feel like in some ways, uh, Violet's adolescent thing, her jag in this movie, The Rage, is there's adolescence that I feel from Mr. Incredible and also from Elastigirl, too. Like when I get on that, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. You guys haven't seen the movie? Yeah. It's all good. But we can't. Don't, don't spoil it. Okay. <laughs> Frank, what's your take on, on that, too? Yeah. So anyway, the part you don't want to hear about the spoiler, here it is. <laughs> You know, Our zone dies. <laughs> <laughs> she has to know that. It's so dark. You are so weird. <laughs> and in the movie, too. I'm uh, on board with Huck. You know, I did, I auditioned and my mom got angry. No, wait a minute. <laughs> I was uh, resentful when I was told where Mr. Incredible was going to be in this film. Not saving lives, not exhibiting any kind of strength at all. You exhibit the biggest kind Oh, it's quiet. Yeah, we are. Quiet. <laughs> and then I found out that I'm going to be helping save the family. Mm. And Bob's going to learn how to be a dad, and he's going to learn about these kids. And then the process started when we were recording. It was just so much fun. I mean, the stuff I did with Bob and, and, and the two of us together. And the, you know, Jack Jack and that whole discovery and then Dash and, and just uh, and then having to deal with Elastigirl out there doing what I want to do but being able to give her the encouragement and let her know that everything's okay at home. You know, it was just a lot of fun. I'm so honored to be a part of it, to, to, to be doing this film. Well, Sophia, I know you're not only a big fan of the first movie, you're a big Pixar fan too. So, what what blew you away in terms of working with the Pixar team, working with Brad, working with the other filmmakers? One of the things that I just think is so cool about the whole thing is, is the layering of all the technology that makes these films look to all of us the way they look in Brad's head. Um, it's wild to see the early stages of animation and, and to watch some of the scenes and then see what they become in the final edit. And it's also totally nuts to go into the studio. And I know that technically I'm talking to Holly, but she's not there. It's like me and Brad, and I'm just yelling into a void going, am I doing this right? Uh, yelling into a what? Oh, God! You didn't even need to do that, actually. That's embarrassing. I'm sweating. Um, that's, like a, that's, a, that's a subconscious trick that we play on ourselves. I've said incredible so many times today while describing the film, and I'm like, that's terrible um, but it, it's really just so much fun and he knows what she's done in the room and he knows how our voices are going to sound together so you just you know you trust your captain and when he tells you you've gotten it right uh, that the tone is right or the volume or the you know the size of your yelling it's it's very cool but, you, know, you know not only do we not see a screenplay sometimes like we don't know where we are in any scene, so you're like, is this in a car? Uh, like, no, it's like, how loud am I? I? Like, you're trying to get a sense of the architect, literal architecture of where the character is, yes. because everything has to be, you know, everything has to be drawn from scratch, and, and so, you, like, a you know, live actor, they're actually in the car or a facsimile thereof. So, like, trying to gauge, but like, where it is. That is what the scene is about sometimes, you know, like it, it's not just that they're at a kitchen table, it's everything that being a family at a kitchen table implies, you know. That's so true. It's like, are you talking to a person who's sitting as far away from each other as we are or somebody who's in the back of the room? Yeah, because 
it does change what you're doing vocally. You know, I want to ask Samuel Jackson here. I want to ask you. So, okay, you are Frozo, you are Nick Fury, and and basically Jedi. part of two superhero you know families here. So, you know, when the first Incredibles came out in 2004 and won the Oscar for Best Animated Feature, I feel like some of the elements from that movie went into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And now, after 19 films in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I feel like some of those elements went into Incredibles 2, a, a little in some way. I mean, do you see the influence of Incredibles on the Marvel films and now Marvel on Incredibles? Can you tell us why you feel it? <laughs> family. <laughs> oh, family. Family. Oh, family. 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 Well, as I remember, that family kind of fell out in Infinity War. Didn't it? <laughs> and you know, it happens. And nobody called me to make them be good. <laughs> I noticed that also. So why am I not there quelling this fight? I did bring all these people in the shield, and now all of a sudden, I'm not there. <laughs> so I don't know what you're talking about. I can't relate. Um, the genre has grown, and, and it's grown inside this kind of one place. Um, sure, there's that other company that makes movies that are like this. Some, a couple of them are there. Uh, but, um, there's a real interesting kind of playbook sometimes that I look at when I watch all the movies, and um, it's like they have this secret sauce that sometimes I wonder because I'm there and I'm looking at the directors. I go, so these guys did a TV show. Why are they doing this? Or this person does these serious dramas. Why is he doing this? But there's something that they they know or they find that you know make it work, and the relationships among the people on the inside of those films always become very intimate and intricate. Um, and sometimes, like, the people that are really related, like Loki and Thor, they don't like each other. Uh, there's family discord. And the people that don't know each other that are looking for that connection become tied together in a very interesting sort of way. And you got your bratty brother and Iron Man, and you got your, you know, kind of lug, kind of special needs kid in Hulk, <laughs> you know, but, and you got your sister who turns out to be Black Widow, who's a real killer, but hard and cold. So all these things come together and these people find a common, a common goal, or they're all working toward the common good, uh, which brings them together in a very unique and, and, and interesting way. And Nick Fury seems to be the kind of how did this turn into an Avengers press <laughs> I'm just saying that they don't let me work in all those movies for a reason. <laughs> because I really don't know what's going on, but I can pretend I do. <laughs> kind of like this. I really don't know what's going on, but I know they need me, and I make the icy stuff, and I make things happen in another kind of way. But thank you for allowing me to do that. Sure, of course. <laughs> we, we really need a bow and arrow, though. We need a bow and arrow guy. <laughs> you need a bow and arrow guy. We don't all need it. <laughs> Catherine Keener. Hi. Good morning. Hello. So, you know, working on the film and, you know, over the years, or, or the extended period of time that you were voicing the character, and then seeing the movie with the cast, with the crew, with the filmmakers, on the big screen. Like, what was that like for you to see the finished product for the first time? Because it's so different from live action. It was very um, thrilling and fun. <laughs> I just wanted to go back to... <laughs> couple things. First, I'm just getting to know all these people. Sarah and I have been friends for a long time, 15, 14 years, whatever. I've known Holly. I've known you, you guys. But um, I'm realizing that that Brad kind of mined the, a lot of the inside of these people. 
in the characters. And like Craig was talking about, I was just talking to him about his kids. And he's a big mush dad, granddad. And um, you can see that. All of these people are awesome. I'd see any movie where Holly is a badass, regardless of gender. Um, and uh, I don't know. I've done press with this man. I know he's done roles where uh, he's played maybe not so likable a guy. Is that right? <laughs> but he actually is very, very sweet, and his character has that too. So um, I just appreciate how insightful you are, even though you're incredibly weird in a way, <laughs> in the best way. It's a column. Yeah, no, it's, I love it. But anyway, so what it was like for me. Can't fire her now. <laughs> <laughs> no, so anyway, what it was like for me to see that was, uh, <laughs> no, I, I, you know, it was, for what it was like for me to see the movie the other night was to kind of uh, get to know the people. I am getting to know more now from doing this um, in a kind of, uh, in their u uniqueness as, as people here. So that's all. How about you, Bob? <laughs> it was super fun to see it. <laughs> I loved it. I, I've, I've been knocked out by the visuals in this film and I've only seen little moments from it in the course of recording this, so to see it in the big, beautiful color on the giant screen, I knew it was going to be amazing, and it, it's beyond all expectations. I feel like somehow there's new technology that you're not telling us about, but because it just looks, it's got such richness and depth that, and that was a great treat, but Again, uh, like everyone else, I didn't read the whole script. There's never a whole script that you can read. So it's the first time I get to see the whole story, and I'm uh, once again amazed at Brad Bird's talent as a writer and director and orchestrator of story. There's like five movies in this movie, and they all work together to throw each other into relief and make each other better. And it, it was a hell of an experience. And everyone in my family, including niece and, niece and nephew, young, my uh, son and daughter, older, teenagers, everyone related to, they enjoyed the whole story, and everyone related to different characters and themes, because there are so many, and they're delivered on so well. I just wanted to mention that when we first started working with Bob, his character wasn't so nice. And, and it changed over the course of working on the film, and you responded so well. I loved it. I love that he became more genuine. I mean, we don't know, I'm not going to give away where he ends up, but when he starts, he's exuberant and excited and almost, and as he goes, you start to see an innocence to him that is, I think, a real twist and surprising. But where it ends up, I won't, I won't say. Well, let's take the questions from the audience. And... I want to ask you, Brad, um, everybody's talking about the visuals. The visuals are outstanding. But most particularly, I want to ask you about working with Ralph Eggleston, your production designer, and what you came up with for your visual palette in terms of celebrating that 50s and 60s architecture that we're so used to seeing like in a Tab Hunter, Rock Hudson, or even Hitchcock's North by Northwest film and the color palette of the muted colors and letting the vibrant neons pop for the superheroes. Uh, well, um, I agree with you that Ralph Eggleston is an amazing talent. Um, he, uh, uh, he came on to the first film when we were just having trouble with the size of, uh, with the size of it. And uh, he kind of came in and helped Lou Romano out uh, uh, just getting it done because it was sort of beyond us at, at, at that point. Um, we were a smaller studio, and the film was larger than we were. So, uh, uh, but Ralph um, loves movies, like most people at Pixar. He really loves um, films, and he's always reading a new book, and he has a thing to show you, and he's kind of always um, kind of disgorging art and books and things that he found and sketches he's made, and he's just kind of spewing them out in every direction all the time, and. Um, uh, the film really benefited from this fuel, but uh, he, 
thinks about color psychologically. Um, he thinks about it um, in terms of what's going to surprise people, what's going to, um, and he's not afraid to make bold choices. We, uh, the house that they wound up in, um, uh, he, we were kind of working on it, and suddenly he came in one day, and we'd already put a lot of effort in another house, and we were under a lot of pressure because they took a year off of our schedule, and. Uh, uh, he said, okay, uh, so I have this idea for that and, and it had in the house. And, um, you know, it, it's really going to screw things up uh, for everyone, including me. Uh, uh, but I just, I have to say it. And, and here's the idea, you know, the house, the house should not work for them. It should be uh, initially impressive, but then you get in there and everything's wrong for a family. And, and there's just, you know, these things that are beautiful originally, the water things, they become like this problem. And, and it's, it's the wrong house for them. And there's no real place for the baby's room. And, and there's a fireplace in the baby's room for no reason. And, and you know, and, he, and everything he's saying, you know, I'm going, oh, that's going to ruin this. And that's going to ruin that. And, but he's totally right. And damn, why is he right? And, and so uh, I agreed to it, and it totally screwed up everything I had in the script in terms of we need to see this in the foreground so we can see that in the background. Suddenly, everything was a giant problem. And yet, it was right because the house needed to be impressive but wrong for the family because uh, they're not in a comfortable place yet. They're, they have to find their way there. And that was a way of making the surroundings um, storytelling, which is really what uh, good production design is. Who's next? Wait, what, didn't Ralph say, didn't he show um, that part of, of the movie at some mid-century modern architecture and furniture show? And when the part where the, the nice mid-century couch falls into the water, all the furniture collectors gasp. <laughs> <laughs> that was made just for them. <laughs> I was very impressed by the detailing of the terrazzo floor. As a person who loves mid-century architecture, I noticed that. There you go. Well, there you go. Right <laughs> on. Fred, I also have a question for Brad. Uh, I know whenever we've talked to you for another movie you've made, we keep asking you, is there going to be an Incredibles 2? Is there going to be an Incredibles 2? You always said you had an idea you were developing, so now that you finally did it, has the idea always been this, or how has it evolved? As uh, it's been half this, two-thirds this. Um, the idea of the role switch, that the assignment would go to Helen rather than Bob, I had when we were promoting the first film. And I also knew that I had the unexploded bomb of Jack Jack's powers, that, that the audience knew that he had them, but the pars did not. And I had other notions that I just wanted to see in an Incredibles movie and some things like the raccoon fight that were originally done for the first movie and there was no place for it, and I loved the idea. Um, but. The superhero part, the villain part, uh, <coughs> always seemed to change. And when I came to Pixar and said, I think I have the other part of the story figured out, the version that got greenlit, um, about four months that we got greenlit, it, uh, it, uh, um, it got the, you know, John and Nicole came on, and, and we got a crew, and we started spending money, and, and got a release date, and then the release date got moved up a year, and suddenly the pressure is huge, and that plot doesn't work. And now I'm screwed because I have a release date, and everybody's going, Incredibles 2, Incredibles 2, we're making up, we're working on Incredibles 2, you know what you're doing, right? You know what you're doing, right? right? And I'm like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Um, and you have two years left, just two, yeah, two more years. Yeah, two years left, uh, right. I like, hope you feel comfortable. You feel comfortable because everybody has high expectations, okay? <laughs> and um, I just realized it didn't serve the, the story, and so the villain plot kept changing. And it kept changing, and Ralph had to adjust to it. Everyone else had to adjust to it constantly, which only made it more anxiety. Um, but I think that we wound up with the right version of this movie. And it wasn't until about a week ago I was talking in one of these things, and I realized that was also true of the first movie, that um, uh, Incredibles was the only project that came outside of Pixar and was pitched to Pixar. And I had drawings, I had designs, I had an uh, outline, you know, the whole thing, and uh, how it looked, and all kinds of artwork that I paid for myself. And if they didn't want to make it, I was going to take it somewhere else. And, and, uh, uh, but I came with a villain that was a different villain 
that we wound up with. And in exploring a alternate opening when I came to Pixar, we, I introduced a villain that we killed off in the opening sequence, and that was a better villain than the one that we had. And suddenly, uh, oh yeah, this guy's better than the one we had, and that was Syndrome. Uh, so the villain kind of, for some reason, I don't know why, but kind of comes last. You know, I, I wanted to uh, talk about how, you know, when you see an animated movie or there's doing PR for an animated film, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll take the kids. But I feel like the first movie, and especially the second one, it's just a great movie. Like, you don't need to take the kids. It's just great for, like, grown-ups. Yeah, kids are strangely treated like beards, you know? <laughs> Single guy, but I want to see this. I found the kid. Can I come in now? Here's this kid. He was roaming the streets. I told him I'd pay for his ticket. Will you let me in? And it's like, no, man. It's an art form. You know, it's it's like it's for anyone that likes movies. And you don't need to have a kid. And you don't. People are constantly coming up to me. My kid really enjoyed it. And I go, did you like it? Bill? Oh yeah, sure, but. But Billy really liked it. <laughs> like, I made it for you, and Billy can come. But uh, I'm not a kid, and I made it something that I would want to see. And we're not kids, and, and we're, we worked on I'm this. I'm a so. kid. <laughs> and you're welcome. Uh, you come anytime. You're welcome. <laughs> what, what's your take on my bad Holly, about, about how this movie, you know, because we talk elsewhere about how it's really, you know, you just go like five soul one day and see the movie and it's like, oh, oh yeah, by the way, it's animated, but it just works on so many levels. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that we probably all felt that way about the first one as well, was, was that it, it was a movie that stood on its own and, you know, it's not a kid's movie. Uh, in, in a way, this one is particularly more not a kids movie, although kids totally dig it. There were a lot of kids in the audience on the premiere night who loved it. And even small kids love Jack-Jack and love Dash. So, um, but I think it works on, it's like Bob said, in a way the movie has complexity that is really astonishing in that it's got like five different movies and they all work in concert with each other you know, they all need each other, all five. But there, it's it's an incredible like fabric that's been woven together. That is very sophisticated. Isn't yeah. that one scene with you two, like early on in the film, and you know, um, you go outside to talk because you're both out of a job, and you don't, and you know, like ha happens to everyone. Your house just got like blown up by a super villain, <laughs> and you're like, where are we gonna live? What are we gonna do for money? And there, there's just like so you're like sharing. There's shared love there, but also just that shared worry. That's a, a really grown up, affecting, beautiful scene between the two of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right here. Peter. Hi, I want to circle back to something uh, for Brad. Um, we, we talked a couple of questions earlier about this, that uh, there's been 14 years uh, since the two movies, and there's a timeless quality to both movies, but there's been a sea change in pop culture, and superheroes were not the dominant force that they are now. And I'm just wondering how much would that affect or not affect the process of developing this movie, whether you felt a uh, need to change anything or adjust anything uh, owing to the rise of the MCU and you know, everything else that's come, come along with this um, incredible explosion of superheroes? Well, uh, well, was there anything that you went, oh, uh, let's not do that? Oh, yeah, I immediately banned three-point landings. You know that? <laughs> <laughs> I just said, no, we're not doing it on this film. Helen did it once in the first film. It's not cool anymore. We're not doing it. And, and, uh, uh, but really, uh, um, uh, the thing was... Uh, God, just, I'm such a blur now. What was the question? Marvel, okay, uh, and all the superhero films. Okay, um, there was a dark moment when when all the machinery was kicked into gear, okay, you got the release date, boom, 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 boom. And uh, I realized two years from now, the film's gonna come out, there's too many superhero movies now. People are, are people gonna be just sick of this in two years? And I went, you know, just what I want to happen, you know, I arrive on the scene, you know, anybody ready for some fresh superheroes? And everybody's like, uh, 
know. Um, so uh, I had a dark moment, and then I realized that what excited me about the idea in the first place was um, not the superheroes. It was um, that it was about the family dynamic and um, and people's uh, roles in different parts of their life and how superheroes. That genre is like a twisted lemon that you squeeze on top of this. It's not what the movie's about. And then I got excited again because, to me, families are, are kind of a, a continent, uh, you know, that, uh, of of um, fresh opportunities because it's it's so universal. And so I got excited again when I thought about it that way. And that was really what excited me about the first movie. And also, you know, I rehearsed the three-point landing. <laughs> For a while, it doesn't work. Who's <laughs> next? Uh, yeah, right here. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect from Jack Jack coming into this movie. We had such an explosion with him at the end of the first film. He turned out to be one of my favorite characters, but probably because of his partnership with the raccoon. And I just wanted to know where did that come from? <laughs> did you guys? you know, decided to give Jack-Jack an animal villain, and, uh, yeah. Well, that was uh, one of our uh, a key artists on, on the first film who helped design the characters and, and, and came up with a lot of great ideas. His name is Teddy Newton. Um, he had this idea back on the original film, and he, and he had a gang of raccoons that Jack-Jack kind of confronts, and the raccoons just kind of come up and shove Jack-Jack in his, his original drawings, and it went a lot darker view. You know? <laughs> uh, they fought and went to the bottom of the pool and all this stuff. And, I mean, uh, but the idea always just killed me because raccoons look vaguely like robbers. And and uh, Teddy did a drawing where he's watching uh, uh, an old movie, like like is in the film, and he sees a classic, you know, robber with a mask. And then he looks out in the yard and something is stealing from him. A robber is stealing from his family. It doesn't matter that it's garbage. Jack Jack doesn't know that. He just knows that he's being robbed and he must do something about it. So uh, I love that. It was so visual and clear and, and it was such an off the wall idea that um, uh, that was one of the things that I couldn't wait to do um, if we got another Incredibles going. Yeah. Got time for two more questions. So let's right back there. Let's go back there. <coughs> Spread the wealth. <laughs> For Holly, Craig, Sam, uh, ever since the first movie came out, do you have kids uh, come up to you, recognize your voice, associate you with this movie particularly? Kids don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Their parents do. <laughs> and then they try to make the kid know who you are. That's gross on, honey. And then he's looking at you like, you don't have a blue suit on. And you're not making ice stuff, so. Nah. Said, Where's my super suit? I mean, oh! And they have to give him a catchphrase, but they don't have they don't know who you are from now. Yeah. Now as they get older, like the kids that are gonna be now, the kids that were four saw the movie and now what, 18, so they've been waiting. They're knocking little kids over to get in line. My daughter's 35, she's knocking big kids over to get in line. <laughs> so, you know, they understand that part, but no, we don't, we don't get a new audience because we did a movie that kids really like. They have no idea who we are in our real selves. Or do they, Craig? No, I mean, it's embarrassing, really, because. You know, and not the dads are saying, look, uh, Bill, there's Mr. Incredible, that's Mr. Incredible. And the kid's just staring at you. Know? And somebody's going out there going, take a picture with Mr. Incredible. This kid don't know who I am. Okay, well, say something like Mr. Incredible. Go ahead. And then he will well, pick something heavier. It's been 14 years. I don't remember what I said the first one. I mean, okay, how about this? It's showtime. And Pick up my car. The kid is like, look my car. Yeah. It's uh, it's just embarrassing. <laughs> one, of my, yeah, one of my best friends told her little daughter Anderson that I was going to be in this movie, and she took a video when she told her, thinking she'd be like, that's so cool. And she goes, mommy, that's not true. And she goes, no, Andy, really, Sophia's going to be a superhero in the movie. And she goes, mommy, she doesn't have all the things a superhero needs. She just was. 
not having it. I was like, well, okay, ego checked. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, from one more. Yes, your brother in the back there. Um, Brent, in the film, when Jack Jack's watching the TV, that's clearly a cartoon that you guys created. But later in the film, you used footage from uh, Outer Limits and Johnny Quest. What was the thought behind that? Well, um, I one of my personal rules in an animated film is, is that if they're watching something on TV, it should be animated. Um, so the soundtrack of the old movie is an actual soundtrack from an old movie that we found that was perfect. And we animated to it. Um, and uh, Johnny Quest is an animated show, so it fit into the universe, and it's the style of the film. It's that kind of action-adventure um, uh, uh, style from the early 60s, so it fits with our film. Outer Limits, we only use the beginning of it because it's still abstract, it's still lines and things, it's not uh, visual photographs. And uh, that part fit really well with the screen slaver uh, thing. Um, you know, because they're talking about taking control of your TV, and I just remember when I was a kid, that scared the crap out of me, you know, uh, that they, the TV once a week was being controlled by, who? aliens? But I couldn't leave the room, but I would just be hiding from the TV uh, because it was being taken over, you know? We control the, the uh, vertical, we control the horizontal, you know, and I'm like, they control the horizontal! <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, uh, well, also, I have to quickly say, and I love Johnny Quest. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people don't remember that it wasn't made for Saturday morning. It was uh, made for prime time. It came on at night, and adults watched it, and uh, uh, people died in it, and it had uh, everything uh, uh, an eight-year-old uh, wants in entertainment. It has mummies, it has pterodactyls, and guns, and a kid from another country who can levitate things, and a bodyguard who has a fling with a girl that might be dangerous, and, uh, uh, you know, lasers, and hydrofoils, and jetpacks, and reptiles, and robot spies, and, and I just about exploded when I saw the opening titles to it. So, um, I, we just had to give Johnny Quest a shout out. Had to. What's your next movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, Incredibles 2 opens on June 15th. Thanks so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you. And